So to those of you who I've never met, I'm Adam Trefanides. Uh, I am a uh, research computing facilitator for, um, so in this training session, we'll be focused on getting started with the command line interface, CLI, the we geeks like acronyms. This class is intended for users who are familiar with the command line and HPC systems in general, but are new to Canon and FASTI. If you had taken our introduction to parallel computing or, or introduction to, to FASTRC, I think that's what we're calling it these days, then you're set for this. Or if you have outside, you know, if you've ever used a Linux machine, basically. Now, note that all these topics, this is just a brief overview and mostly just to get you started on the cluster. And we can take uh, more in-depth questions in the chat tool. And we'll, we'll, we will be um, pointing you to, to other places where you can get some more information. So SSHing, SSHing is uh, short for secure shell, S shell. And a shell is how you, it's what you're talking, what you're in when you're on a, on a terminal. And I can give you a quick demonstration of logging into, here we go, logging into the cluster. So here you see, I have at the command line here, SSH J Harvard, this is our pretend person, never really existed. And we log in and then you have a password and then it's going to prompt you for the two-factor code. It's a six digit code. There we are. All right. So J Harvard has logged in. So you'll note here that there are, there's some information here. This is called the moat D. It's message of the day. It goes back to the beginning of Unix. It's, there's important information that we put up here for you to, for you to see. There are links to documentation. There's notifications about maintenance coming up, things like that. And then there are specific URLs. You can copy paste those into your browser and the, and relatively new thing uh, that we've implemented just at the end of last year was that we have slurm stats for what happened, what jobs and how much work you did yesterday comes up on here. And I'll just go back to here. So you'll notice a couple other things here. It, it announces which, what server you're on. We have the Canon cluster and the FASI cluster. So you type your password, the cursor, cursor doesn't move when you have your password, you get the verification code, the two factor. It, you have a Harvard two factor, um, fat, uh, fast RC, we, we run our own two factor system and in getting your account created, you go through a process of, of getting a two factor set up. And so you can do it on Java desktop app duo or in password manager systems like one password. They, they also support those. So this is, this gives you a view of a successful login and you'll notice that there are, so the one on the left is Canon, one on the right is FASI. And you'll note that FASI cluster and Canon cluster, it, they announce themselves differently. FASI is the secure cluster. And you'll note that at the bottom there, the prompt changes to tell you which host you're connected to. And here is a, a graphic to give you an idea of what's happening when you're connecting into the, into the cluster. You'll see here that this is, you know, it's a, it's a, a diagram of, of big computers. You are down there in the lower right cluster user on, on your, your, it looks like it might be an, an iMac. And then there are two ways to, two main ways to get in. There's the login nodes, which is what we're dealing with today. The command line stuff. There's also the open on demand or VDI nodes, which are, there was actually a class earlier today on that. It's a more graphical way of, of, uh, working inside the cluster. So, so this is your computer here. And when you start an SSH session to one of our login nodes, it connects your local terminal to the remote computer. And now that terminal is over here. So when you start an interactive session in Slurm, so when you've SSH'd in, now you're on the on that one of the login nodes there. And then when you start an SSH, when you start an interactive Slurm session, start a job in the cluster, it connects you into one of the compute nodes in the cluster, which is, you know, imagine one of those little dots is another, is a computer that you're now on. And so then your, your prompt will change again. And then now your terminal, what you're looking at in the terminal will be actions that are happening on inside that compute node, which is a computer, one of, one of thousands, literally thousands and thousands of other computers. So 
login nodes versus compute nodes. So login nodes, you when you're logged into to like boss login, Holly login, Fassy login. Well, I guess you won't be logging into Fassy login, but most of the time. But you're li you're limited to a single core and four gigs of RAM. These are not designed for doing any kind of analysis. This is really the login nodes are really for you to jump off of into the into the cluster because everybody is using a, a limited number of login nodes. When you start uh, um, a session in the cluster, then you've got your own set of uh, parameters that you've set up, and uh, um, and you can you can do you got you have as many CPUs as you can possibly get and whatever. So don't run jobs on the login nodes. You're just going to get frustrated, and and they're also they're set up really really similarly to the to the cluster nodes, but there there are subtle differences. So the compute node via an interactive uh, doing getting onto a compute node via an interactive job. So you can you can start a Slurm job on on a compute node, and you get a terminal, which is what I was sort of alluding to earlier. And that's a really good way to, in an interactive session to test your software, test your code, make sure that that the environment that you built it on, maybe it was a desktop or a laptop or some other server, make sure that that code, that all the environment makes sense on in the cluster. You, you may have to move some things around. And then you can then uh, request resources from Slurm using Salic. We'll go into that a little bit. That's just slurm allocation is what that's short for and if you log out of it that session is done it's gone and if you if it's, if it's idle for more than an hour the session will freeze up but the interactive session is important for uh, debugging and, and working out your code here's an example of an interactive job on canon starting an interactive job so you see in the top command line there jay harvard's on boss login s, s allocate and then you choose a partition, you choose the amount of memory per CPU that you're running. By default, you get a single CPU and time one hour, and then you'll get this going. Uh, so let's see if I can, if I can use a command line in the class that I'm supposed to be teaching on how to use the command line. Okay, so we do, oops, so lock partition. I'm going to use the test partition. One gig. Time. Boom. Now I have a job, and you'll you'll notice that now the the name of the system that I'm on is Holly Two. That number tells us where it is physically. That's what I said. The slide says what I just said. So, and that's somewhere in there. It's in that red cabinet. I don't really know. Oh, I'm, I didn't push you back to this. So, oops, where did I go? So yeah, that's what we just did. And if you need an interactive job on FASI, you can't do that from the command line. You can't can't get an interactive job. You would then need to go through OOD or VDI and get a remote desktop. And that's, that's the same as having a, a command line on in FASI. So in general, when you start a job, on the cluster, what you're doing is you're you're setting up an environment for your job to run in, and you do that by either on the command line, like I just did with Salloc, where I said which partition to put it on, how much CPU, how you know how much time it should run. You can do that in a batch script, right? So this is a simple example of a batch script. This just says that. Each one of these, each one of these lines that starts with S batch tells Slurm that you're going to give it a, you're going to give it a, a directive. And this way you can automate your jobs and they will keep running. Even if you shut down your, you get out of the, the, the cluster from your laptop entirely, because once you run this, it's handed to Slurm, which is a scheduler and Slurm will, will find the resources necessary to run your job and then it will submit it for you and at the end you can tell it to send you an email when it's finished or you can just check back with it and find you know your results are done and so there's some links here for documentation on how to manage a, a slurm script and i don't know if, i haven't been showing you this the this the uh, slides have i i'm really sorry about that do you see what i was talking about now no I can see the, the slide though. You can see the slide now? That's what... 
Yeah. I'm really sorry about that. So here's what I have been looking at and talking about. There's an S batch directive for all the different bits that you're going to be telling Slurm to do. And there's a couple of links there to our documentation. Have I completely confused everybody? You're all good. All right. So it is best practice to test your code first. And because if you fire off a job that grabs a whole lot of resources, your lab is going to be charged for all of those resources, even if the job fails because of you've you've created some sort of a loop or something. It doesn't doesn't it doesn't stop running when it's supposed to, things like that. So being sure that your job, being you know, as sure as you can that your job should run the way you expect it to run. There are some tools that allow you to monitor how your job is running. One of the more useful ones is SACCT. SACT is how I say it. Every 30 seconds, whatever's happening in, on the system gets written to a log and you can go look at it. Again, there's some more documentation for how to best use this kind of a tool. Using SACT in this way, RecMem and MaxRSS will give you an idea of um, after the job's done, how much memory you actually used. So if, if, you, if you request a huge amount of memory and you only use a very small amount of it, then you're being charged for memory that, that you didn't need to use. And you're also making it so that that memory is not available to other people on the system or other jobs on the system rather. And so it's a, it's a good idea to run a test. If you can break your, 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 your job, your, your code down into, you know, a representational um, block, run that in the test partitions, which is cheaper than running on the re regular uh, cluster. And then, check to see what your, your memory usage was. And if you actually used all the CPUs that, that you thought you were going to use, and then adjust your, your, your request for those resources when you run the real job. Ceph is another sort of quick and dirty tool to give you an idea of, of how well your job ran job. It, it's slurm efficiency is what it stands for. There's a couple of examples of, of running it. Our cluster Canon cluster is also known as Odyssey. Don't get, don't get worried about that. But yeah, you can see there you've got, uh, you give it a, a job ID for Ceph. That's what that number is. And you get back whether it completed or it's, it may not, it may have failed. That's another output it can do. It can tell you how many cores it used. And, and it does a, it does a pretty good job of how efficient was your job compared to the resources that you requested. On the clusters, there are a number of different partitions, and a partition is a set of nodes. Nodes are compute node or a, a computer, one set of machines. Right? So in this, you can do S part to get information about what partitions are available to you. Depending on the, the groups that you're in, you may have access to some lab partitions that are outside of, sorry, that are not available, not, not accessible by, by the regular general group. And again, there's a, a good, the uh, convenient Slurm commands uh, page is, gets a lot of hits. It's, uh, it's got some good, uh, good information in there for finding a way around uh, the command line in Slurm. So there are a number of ways to get software on the system, an older one. And we still use this for large globally available software that needs to be really globally available and LMOD, the module system where uh, software is um, compiled and built with a set of known environmental uh, variables in it. And so you can have a module for, you know, three different versions of, of Python. And, you, and so you can choose which one of those versions of Python you want to use. You can have a module for different other, other kinds of scientific software. Python is a little bit probably not the best example, but you know, you could have like different versions of, of Mathematica or something where maybe there's a, there's some software that it only runs in one specific version of Mathematica, or you're trying to replicate results with somebody that somebody did with a different version of that kind of thing. So there are, you know, it's record of your research workflow. That's, you know, so the main thing for this slide is that it's, it's tempting to put the loading commands for modules in your bash rc in the bash rc if you you know terminal it sets up the environment you can, you can have it do all sorts of things like set up your your prompt and and load you know different kinds of software and things 
if you do that, you you can get yourself into if if you load the same modules every time you log in. First, it'll take a long time to log in because it has to go and find these modules. When they break, they break, and they make it can make it so that it's really difficult for you to log in. So our recommendation is to keep um, uh, lo the the loading of modules in like a wrapper script or or in a, in a batch file, like you know the first command after you've set up you know in the in a, in a batch job launching you you have a line in there that loads the modules specifically for that job and that way every time you know that the right modules are are in there you could also put in a purge command um, right before you start loading the software in your and put that in your in your batch script that way it cleans out any modules that are already loaded that you've forgotten about and then and then loads all the ones that it needs and you get a nice clean setup. SPAC is the other way to, to install software. This SPAC has a huge amount of software already configured for you to download and install to your specific needs. And you can, and we recommend that you, you store the executables and do all the work, for, you know, store this new software in the lab directory and maybe in a software or something direct uh, folder in there so that your whole lab can have access to it. So not, not everybody in your lab is, is rebu rebuilding the same software over and over again. And, and that's the more, that's the more efficient place to keep your software. And uh, there's good recommendation for, for doing, for running Salloc where it works best in an interactive session, like I showed you before, with eight cores of CPU, with eight CPUs and 12 gigs of RAM. And uh, yeah, and that's an example command for starting up a, an interactive session to, to compile some software. So I did this quick and I am sorry for the, the glitches at the beginning. And, and I hope that you have found something out that I may have hopefully answered some questions for you. If there are any other questions, by all means.